All right, I think we are going to start now because it seems to me that we are live. Am I correct? Yes. yes. Okay, brilliant. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Uh, my name is Dr. Fred Basso. I am a staff at LSE Academic, and uh, I am here with a panel of uh, colleagues uh, who are uh, going to talk about diversity. So as you can see uh, on this slide, diver uh, the, uh, different perspectives on diversity of thought in um, social uh, science. Uh, social science, so it's broad, and we understand the psychology. We, there are psychologists, we understand, or biologists also, by the way. We understand psychology as a social science, so we want to have a broad uh, perspective on psychology. So before introducing my, my colleagues, my... Uh, my, my friend Dario, who is here, uh, asked me to give a brief uh, introduction to the topic. And he said, well, actually, what you should do is uh, to talk about your experience. And I thought, uh, well, it's going to be super boring. Why would I talk about my experience? Because uh, there is nothing exciting to say that much about myself. So, and my colleagues are way more exciting than me <laughs> with what they do. So I thought, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to approach it differently. I'm going to think of what I would say when I see, for instance, diversity of thought. And I thought, well, there is a very famous metaphor that we use in English and that perhaps you have also uh, in your uh, native language, if you are not English speaker, that is food for thought, you know, that basically we use expressions like, for instance, oh, that's an idea, I need to digest it, or, oh, it's very hard to stomach, or, oh, that's a disgusting idea. So there is something about food and thinking, and both are associated. And we think very much in terms of metaphors and in terms of analogies. Uh, that's our natural way of thinking. Uh, this is what we observe when we do studies in psychology and in linguistics. And so I thought, well, perhaps I should think of an analogy to think of diversity uh, because metaphors and analogies are so important in the way we think. So if we think about diversity and food, for instance, we might think, well, who would be excited to eat the same thing every day? Pretty much no one. Imagine if every day you are giving lentils, right? You eat lentils every day, every meal, the only thing you have is lentils. That's, that's a bit frustrating, nothing exciting. You don't wake up, you feel, oh, great, I'm gonna eat lentils. It's not gonna happen. So the thing is that what we see is that when we eat lentils and we don't have diversity, then we are craving for diversity. We want something else. So now imagine that you eat green lentils every day, that one day you are given pink lentils. That's, that's, that's in, actually, that's different from what you had before. So we might think, oh, it's a bit of diversity. So it's, it's more exciting, pink lentils instead of green lentils, that's amazing. And so why is this different from green lentils? Well, it is different because the green lentils are setting a standard. They are the reference point, you see? And so because it's the reference point, we cannot think of diversity if we don't take in the first place a reference point. So pink lentils are diverse or different from green lentils, but it's not that much different. But if you narrow things down, if you focus very much on something like that, then you might see some form of diversity because of the repetition of what has been done before. So now you want to think, well, where does it go? Why, why are we talking about lentils to talk about diversity of thinking? Well, because lentils are a commodity, right? It's, it's a commodity. And there is something about science that we can observe nowadays is that science became commodified. Science became a commodity too. And so the thing is that it became a commodity because it's mass produced. It became a commodity because it's standardized. It became a commodity because we set benchmarks to say whether something is scientific or not. But when we do set the benchmark, actually what we do is that we create a reference point. And this reference point is what is going to define diversity afterwards. So if we think about science with the fact that we standardize pretty much everything, and especially methodology, this is how we claim that something is scientific usually, then what we do when we do that is that we decide what is going to be above or below the standard. 
but the standard has been fixed and defined by people. And so therefore these standards are political in the first place. And so what we are going to discuss tonight is actually the idea that in science, you don't have something that we can think out of a standard, out of a reference point, and that according to the reference point we are going to take, then we might think of diversity and perhaps it's going to narrow or not the scope of diversity. If you think of something standardized, we might think that, oh, then there is a profession that is attached to it. And so we need to think of people who are used to doing that on a daily basis. And so we don't leave um, the, some room for other people who are not academics by training, who are not professionals. Or perhaps we set a standard that is associated to some form of thinking that is Western thinking. And so we consider that what is diverse is what is not standard, what is not Western. So you see that the way we posit a standard is going to define what is going to be diverse and so therefore what is going to be normal or abnormal, what is going to be out of the norm. So that's what we are going to discuss tonight with several different positions with people with different backgrounds and experiences. So we will have Dr. Nihan, so I want to be sure that I can correctly, Alberak Edmir, who is working with uh, Open University as a fellow. She is also with the London School of Economics. We have Celestine here, Celestine Oko Roji, who is, thank you, Mr. Lestin, who is a LSE fellow uh, associated to King's College also and researchers with Black uh, Thrive, which is a charity. Uh, we have Rogers Bacon here, who is a teacher, a famous blogger, and also the founder of a new journal that is called uh, Seeds of Science that he founded with uh, Dario here. We have Mrs. Miss Fei Yang uh, Wang, who is a uh, a future doctor from the London School of Economics. She's uh, submitting her PhD in a month, so a lot of pressure. <laughs> um, and uh, Dr. Dario Krapan, who is here with uh, LSE, working with LSE. Um, so now um, we are gonna listen to uh, Nihan and uh, our presentation about her uh, experience. Thank you. <clears throat> uh... That was a great, great introduction, first of all. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us. And I'm really pleased to be invited uh, here. Uh, so I guess I'll share my views on diversity by touching on my personal experiences. So the concept of diversity has been discussed a lot in science. And in the last decade, it has even become a buzzword. And many scientists think that with diversity, we can um, develop innovative ideas or bring or create some solutions to the, some of the most pressing, pressing issues of our time. But my understanding of diversity or my approach to diversity is a bit different than that. I think we cannot achieve anything with diversity alone. I think diversity is a tool and it's not the end. So it's critical that we understand how and uh, what we want to achieve and how we want to achieve diversity in science and how we want to make use of this tool in science. So I want to use my personal background as an example for this. So as you can see, my name is not a Western name and I'm a visibly Muslim woman and I'm from Turkey where I also did my undergrad studies. So because of all these characteristics, in most of the scientific places I've been to, I've been considered as a walking example of diversity. So in all of those events, organizers made sure to take my pictures repeatedly to show how diverse they are. Diverse they are. And I also got invited to, to give talks, like give lectures, write pieces, to show diversity. And this is to me how diversity looks from the outside. And now let's flip the coin and see how diversity looks uh, from the inside. Uh, and by this, I mean how I live the diversity experience. And of course, there's a lot of factors affecting the, the experience of diversity, but I specifically want to focus on a few things. Uh, the first one is passport privilege. So as I told you, I'm from Turkey. Turkey is a country in Europe uh, 
which is not considered European enough to be an EU member, which meant that when I was studying in the UK, I was an international student. So I paid the double the amount of the money EU students pay to receive the same education. And if I didn't have a scholarship, I wouldn't be able to study in the UK. It also meant that every time I, went, uh, I wanted to present my scientific ideas in international conferences, I had to apply for a visa, which is very costly and very, uh, very costly in terms of both time and money. So if I really want to make a contribution to the global scientific uh, knowledge production, I had to travel. I had to spend a lot of money and a lot of time compared to my uh, peers. So I did. I even applied for a Schengen visa uh, five times a year because all the visas I received were only lasting for five days or three days, like the length of the conference. And the second issue I want to discuss is the language. Um, I, again, I told that I did my undergrad in Turkey. And when, when I was doing my undergrad studies, I intentionally chose a university where I was taught in English with American textbooks. So after I completed my undergrad studies, I came to the UK, I completed three different postgrad postgraduate degrees. And as you can see, uh, even though I look different, I don't feel different at all because all my training, all the training I received, I received in English and they were all based on Western systems of knowledge. So while people promote me for my differences, I feel the same because my education and my training is the same with lots of people in the global uh, scientific knowledge production. So that is all just to say that um, the language we use in scientific knowledge production affects the way we think, the uh, questions we ask, the answers we seek. And if I, my mother tongue is Turkish, but if you ask me to give a scientific talk in Turkish, I wouldn't be able to do that because I don't know the words in Turkish. So if I were asked to write a paper, for instance, in Turkish, I will first write it in English, then trans translate it to Turkish, then ask uh, one of my Turkish scientist friends to check it be to see if it makes sense because I did and it didn't. It usually doesn't make any sense. And it's very hard for Turkish people to understand what I uh, write scientifically. So I think that's a big problem. In science, we limit ourselves. We miss lots of critical perspectives just by using one language. And if, I mean, I lack the passport privilege and I lacked the uh, language privilege but I somehow got around them and I am here today. I am talking here today because I somehow managed to get around them, got around them and I can talk English. I have residence, that's why I'm here. But if I decided to stay in Turkey and if I decided to continue my studies in Turkish, my scientific contributions would only be at the national level and no one, including you, wouldn't be aware of it. So what I, the message I want to give is diversity is just a tool. And what we want to achieve with this tool and how we want to achieve it with this tool are the real questions we need to be talking on and we need to be answering on. Because uh, we cannot achieve anything if we don't address the systemic problems that created the norms we have in science. And without, without addressing these norms and these scientific pro, um, systemic problems in science, we cannot, I, I don't think we cannot do um, so many meaningful things with diversity. Yeah. Thank you. presentation from Roger. Yes. yes. Um, so thank you. That was fantastic. Um, 
So I'm an anonymous blogger, and along with Dario, we are uh, co-founders of a new scientific journal, Seeds of Science, which I think we'll touch on later. Um, but for uh, my background and why I'm here, um, so originally um, from Baltimore, Maryland, um, and my background is actually in biology. Um, I'm a PhD student dropout, um, just decided to get the master's degree, which sounds a, a little bit cooler to say you're a master than a PhD, right? <laughs> um, um, but since uh, you know I left that, I got into secondary school teaching, and I've you know been a teacher for the last six years in the New York City area. Um, so you know when I decided I wasn't going to become a you know a PhD researcher, and I kind of gave up that dream, uh, I, you know I still felt like I had a lot to give to science, and you know in my free time was still you know thinking deeply about biology, about you know the nature of scientific research, and. Um, you know, questions as I was teaching, you know, related to science education and just the sort of the psychology of being a scientist. Um, and during this time, I think I just kind of randomly stumbled across some papers uh, by Dario and it was COVID. I had some time on my hands and sent him a, a long rambling email with some just unsolicited comments on his uh, research. Um, but credit to Dario for actually kind of engaging with the ideas, and we began a little correspondence, um, which eventually led to uh, a collaboration on, on a paper that we published last year. And, you know, the general idea of that, uh, so, you know, Neon talked about systemic change and changing norms. Uh, and, you know, as we know, that is just an incredibly difficult thing to do. It takes time, effort. Um, so our idea was, you know, one thing you can do is you know, try to include people outside the system. Um, so the idea was, you know, how and why can we get amateurs involved in psychology and social science research? Um, so just to kind of clarify there, um, when we say amateurs, it's really just somebody who's not getting paid to be a professional social science researcher. Uh, so someone like myself who, you know, I had scientific training, I try to read widely in psychology and other sciences but you know i'm the the work and the, the thinking i do is not paid i'm not associated with any you know formal institution so you know, amateur you know might have certain connotation, uh, connotations um but these can be people who have phd's in another field uh but you know have left science but you know still wish to make scientific contributions um and then you know, there is this whole kind of paradigm of citizen science, we really met something different, whereas, you know, we're not talking about like low level things where, you know, you're just a participant in a study or contributing data or something like, you know, data annotation. Um, but we really think that, you know, amateurs, independent researchers, really more and more, we need to be bringing them into the knowledge work, uh, generating ideas, hypotheses, speculation, ideas for experiments. So kind of along those lines, I think there's you know, really two important dimensions of diversity I'd like to sort of put into play. Um, the first we'd say is just psych psychological diversity. So who, who are the people that are actually conducting social science research? How are they able to think? How is their thinking constrained by their cultural, socioeconomic background, their, their, their biology even, their education? Uh, all these factors that, you know, sort of shape their mind and thus, you know, how they're able to do research. So, you know, I think I'm, oh, we have a future PhD, but everyone here either has a PhD in social science or will. And so, I mean, the reality is that for all intents and purposes, being a professional academic researcher means you have to go through, uh, you know, the first quarter of your life or more this, you know, entire kind of educational and academic uh, gauntlet. I mean, <laughs> it's a little strong, but, um, you know, it's a really significant uh, commitment of time and effort. Um, and that's, you know, that's really what it means today to be a professional researcher. Um, and that's, you know, of course, necessary to some degree. Science is, you know, more complex than it's it's ever been. But the reality is, you know, that does, uh, you know, induce certain psychological constraints because, you know, of course, it's you need to be smart and creative and knowledgeable about science. But there's a lot else that you need to get through that that gauntlet. So you need to be very conscientious 
diligent, have a very strong work ethic, have the mental and physical attributes that can support such a work ethic, um, have a, a degree of emotional intelligence and social savvy so that you can self-promote and uh, play the academic game, we might say. Uh, and then more and more, you have to just be you know, incredibly well-rounded. Uh, so obviously very strong verbally, so you can give presentations, job interviews, lab meetings, and just huge amounts of writing. Or you know, as they say, if you don't publish, you'll, you'll perish. So you have to be very strong verbally. And in most domains of science, incredibly strong quantitatively and, and computationally. And even more than that, you have to be willing to do both and actually enjoy it. Uh, so, you know, for my case, um, when I kind of was not so sure I wanted to continue with my PhD, I um, was doing kind of genetics and bioinformatics, and I loved the kind of more verbal and theoretical side of things, which is why I'm a writer now. Uh, but I found, you know, almost all of my time was just computational data analysis, and I started to just feel like a square peg in a round hole. And I just knew that's not what I wanted to do. Um, I was also lazy and disorganized, but that was that's another issue. <laughs> um, so really, all of this is to say that just the, the entire system is uh, creating a certain amount of psychological homogeneity, uh, just by virtue of what it takes to, to, to get all the way through. And, you know, I guess along those lines, you could also say, Again, with such a you know commitment of time and effort, you are kind of precluding certain life experiences and skills that you might develop. Um, not that it's you know not that it's impossible. These are all you know incentives, and not that there aren't people who find ways to you know become a professional researcher that might not have all of these psychological traits. But it's an uphill battle. So. It, you know, it might be pretty hard for someone to be a professional athlete and also a PhD student or a Buddhist monk or, or any number of things, uh, life experiences, skills, which, you know, if you were that person, you might think differently and develop different ideas for research and, and so on. Uh, so it's a second kind of dimension of diversity uh, we might call, say, you know, functional diversity. So in theory, as a social scientist, you are free to think in any kind of way about anything and conduct any number of research activities. But the reality is that in practice, there are very strong incentives and constraints that are going to limit your work. Um, so I think this was kind of the general idea of that, that paper about amateurs in psychology that I mentioned earlier. Um, we sort of proposed that these independent researchers, people who are outside the system, uh, by virtue of not facing these same incentives and constraints that limit professionals, uh, there should be certain areas or just kinds of research where they can make real contributions because professionals having a career, having to promote yourself, having to publish in high impact journals and just worry about how you market yourself as a scientist you are not going to do certain things. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll, I'll touch on some of these kind of blind spot areas later. But one big one is uh, an amateur, if they are sufficiently motivated, could work on something for a very long time, a project that takes five years, 10 years, um, and can evolve throughout and maybe, you know, find something, some really hard won knowledge where, uh, a, you know, an academic, again, you know, I talked about publish and perish, Good luck, you know, starting a, pro a five year project for your PhD, especially if it's risky and it might not turn into any publications. You don't know if you'll find anything interesting. Um, and that's fine. There's a lot of, you know, more short term projects that are important. But if we are kind of limiting that scope of what you are even capable of thinking about, even conceiving, you know, you won't even think that I could do some project that might take so long take such a long time, uh, you're, you know, really going to be limiting just, you know, the diversity of thought in some ways. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Celestia? Thank you. Uh, thanks for that. Hi, everyone. Um, no one else has been using notes, so now I feel oh uh, <laughs> I feel like the odd one out because I've got notes. But um, I tend to go off piece anyway, so uh, let's see. Let's see how it goes. Um, 
Um, I'll try not to speak too long. Um, so obviously, thank you for the opportunity to come along and, uh, and talk. Um, and of course, other speakers have spoken eloquently on the topic already. Um, I will keep my remarks relatively brief and focus on three sort of broad areas. So first of all, I would say that we need to take standpoint epistemology seriously if we're to make progress on the complex social issues which are in the purview of the social sciences. Uh, we're also going to need to recognize that there is no disinterested place from which research can emerge. Uh, and finally, that diversity in the sense of social categories like class, race, gender, sexual orientation, disability, and so on, is necessary to make diversity of thought a reality, but it may not be sufficient. Uh, so I want to illustrate these points with a few examples, some personal, some not. So I hope you'll in, indulge me for the next couple of minutes while I, while I talk to you. Uh, so firstly, just thinking about what I mean by standpoint of epistemology, what I'm saying is that knowledge is socially situated, as, as Fred kind of spoke to right at the beginning, and that epistemic privilege, so the ability to kind of know something a bit more than someone else about a certain topic, can come from a position of marginalization from, from being in a particular social category. So that is to say, having experienced something through the lens of a particular social category, a person may be in a stronger position to ask useful questions and conduct novel research. Um, a little while before I joined the LSE, this is part of my personal story now, a little while before I joined the LSE as an MSc student in 2015, you can try and guess my age if you like, um, I was unemployed and being from a working class background, my unemployment required me to lean on the social safety net and claim unemployment benefits. Um, I was unemployed for over a year. So when you, in this country, when you get unemployed for a long time, they start to really cr clamp down on you. They'll tell you to come in every day. They'll watch you while you apply for your jobs and so on. You have to bring receipts and all this kind of stuff. Um, but my experiences during that time shaped what became my PhD thesis. Importantly, it also shaped how I went about my thesis. So focusing specifically on the social context and how we understand who unemployed people are, what they do, what we know about them as a society more generally, rather than looking uh, deeply into some individual differences between unemployed people and employed people. Uh, why is that the case? Um, it's the case because my experiences of that situation wouldn't allow me to consider that I had some special difference between me and the people who were employed. Um, luckily or unluckily, uh, depending on your perspective, many people are doing that kind of work, which is looking for these individual differences uh, between unemployed people and others. Um, uh, and so that, that kind of area of research is not, is not minimized, but hopefully, um, through these experiences and exploring them in my PhD thesis, I'm adding to the diversity of research work on unemployment from a kind of new or different perspective, I hope. Um, I think that many people who pursue PhDs are studying themselves or their experience in some way, um, at least in the Department of Psychological and Behavioral Sciences, if you go and you look at the submitted PhD thesis for the last number of years, you can trace in those PhDs um, people's lived experiences and how they manifest as their kind of research projects. I won't say what they are, but folks around will know um, that some of their experiences are embedded within their, their PhDs. Okay, so moving to my second point on kind of the issue of positionality, um, I really enjoy the following quote, which is from uh, Gita Reddy and her colleagues, um, and they talk about academic research. Um, and they say, academic research gives the impression that our observations originate from nowhere in particular, and thus lay claim to applicability everywhere in general. I really uh, love this quote. And um, in my work in Black Thrive, um, we kind of investigate a very small aspect of this in relation to employment support. So um, just 
kind of follow this logic with me, um, the literature tells us that having a long-term health condition impacts our ability to find and maintain good work. Similarly, we know that racism impedes Black people's job prospects, and additionally, that Black people themselves disproportionately suffer from long-term health conditions. So from my perspective as a Black person, it's kind of obvious that uh, we should need to assess the efficacy of employment support interventions, both in relation to long-term health conditions, but also in relation to the other aspects of um, people's identity that come along with it. So um, I'm saying that we need to foreground a kind of intersectional approach. So I and other colleagues at Black Pride went about looking for this evidence, um, which we expected to be numerous. Um, unfortunately, uh, we were sorely mistaken. And uh, a systematic literature review, which, we st which started from 868 potentially in scope papers, gave us only six articles to include in the review, which look at both employment support, long-term conditions, and race or ethnicity in a way in which we could identify um, the particular effects for Black participants. I I'm telling that story because it indicates something, again, about the questions that go unasked, because uh, people, through their lived experiences and the social categories they op occupy, may be interested in these questions, but are simply not here to ask them. Uh, I, I think this is leading us to a narrower social science than would otherwise be the case. Um, given all of that, finally, I think I should say um, that I'm generally wary of the term diversity of thought. Um, because although I agree with it in principle, it's often used elsewhere, not in this place, but elsewhere, um, as a way to avoid critical discussions about racism, sexism, classism, and all of the other isms that are um, not uh, usual in polite discussion. And so with that in mind, uh, I will use this platform um, to say that it's quite likely that academia is the most homogenous <laughs> profession in Britain. <laughs> Uh, don't let the makeup of this particular panel pull you <laughs> into a false sense of security. <laughs> In the case of Black people, there are only 160 Black professors in the UK. That is less than the number of universities. <laughs> and indeed, those 160 Black professors are drawn from all over the world. That indicates something quite clear about what is possible for black people growing up and being educated in this society. It says that you cannot know things and generating knowledge is not something that's for you. We must uh, change that and, uh, and challenge it if we are to have a social cycle, uh, not a social psychology, I'm a social psychologist, my bad, a social science. If we are to have a social science uh, that is fit for purpose, whilst also not forgetting that it is not only the responsibility of marginalized scholars to end marginalization. That endeavor is all of our responsibility. Thank you. as well. No. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Let me do it there. Can you move it from your no? Can should I go there? Move it. Yeah. Let, let's go there. Yeah. <laughs> no. Okay. I can huh? uh, yeah. there you I don't have any. Can you hear me? Yes. So, yeah, as you can see, I'm also a national student and I'm with them. So, I can relate a lot with what Niha has been saying. Um, but, yeah, I also struggle a lot with race acts recently because of my PhD is coming towards the end. But, 
to add more diversity to this discussion, I would not focus on my personal life, but my research experience. I have been doing cross-cultural comparison research in psychology during the past four years. And I would like to call for more diversity in terms of theoretical frameworks and methodology used in this field, because I can sense that whenever I try to when beyond whenever I try to like step aside of the like we established Western paradigm, then it will be harder for me to publish a paper. So I will start with an example. Uh, last year, I conducted a pair of experimental studies on the U.S. and Chinese people's different responses to the mad bird animals uh, family. And it's a pre-registered study and it's well powered. Uh, the study show that um, exposure to this family mad bird successfully discouraged uh, Chinese participants' intentions to consume meat, but it didn't have such impact on the U.S. participants. I adopted a, a very prestigious Chinese sociologist uh, theory to interpret my result. The Chinese sociologist is Pei Xiaotong. If there are any Chinese uh, students here, you may have heard of him. So he's like the biggest name in sociology in China. And uh, the, his work was um, derived from his work, his works were uh, his theory was derived on like solid field quality works and um, inside China. And I, the general idea of that theory is that um, family plays a very crucial and special role in structuring the Chinese society. So that might be why this method has a stronger impact on the Chinese participants. So I submit that paper to a journal and got very negative feedback uh, because. First, the, the reviewers are not convinced that uh, family is a, plays a special role in the Chinese society. And also, uh, I realized that they, uh, it, this is the most frustrating part. I realized that even the best sociologist work inside, uh, produced by Chinese sociologists are not read or recognized by researchers here. So. Uh, and they propose something like, why don't you use uh, collectivism versus individualism? So Hobbes has uh, cultural dimensions, and everyone heard about it. Um, and they want me to re reuse their measurements, and they reject the paper. So, um, but to me, this experience is frustrating because uh, it's like uh, if the publication process is favoring uh, we're established uh, series proposed by American researchers in the last century, then we're, no matter how many research has been published with Chinese participants, we, we're aware of the weird sample issue where mm -hmm. there are tons of papers written by Chinese researchers and pop, uh, like conducted on Chinese participants, published in English journals. But still, uh, we are looking at Chinese culture or other, any other non-Western cultures through a Western lens. And, and all those characteristics repeatedly measured and studied by um, our mm -hmm. scholars may not even be the traits that considered as important by the people who are living in that culture. That would be like slightly offensive to people in that culture. And also it um, prevent us from actually looking into the cross-cultural differences we have never thought about. And also uh, a second reason for me to mm, feel concerned about this experience is that, I, as I said, that uh, theory was mm, based on qualitative works. And from how the reviewers co uh, comment on that theory, I have the feeling that qualitative evidence is not really considered as evidence by most psychologists. And it's understandable because uh, the mainstream, like the norm in psychology is the experimental method. And recently, I would say that a large scale uh, longitudinal study, uh, longitudinal survey studies are also gaining a popularity, but interviews and participant observations, this kind of um, mm, qualitative method, like originally from anthropology are not really taken as evidence by 
most psychologists, and they still prefer to um, they still prefer evidence like the standardized uh, Likert scale like kind kind of data um, we all rely on during during our education and during our uh, training process. So uh, I can. Actually, I, I'm a very much quantitative person. I have taught quantitative methods. I've been using experimental methods and survey methods to, throughout my PhD. But since I'm the one who relatively know this method where well, I always feel it's, uh, it's problematic to only rely on it, and it can produce very misleading results when it comes to mm -hmm. uh, cross-cultural research. I can take another example. So in, in one of the past papers, uh, published, uh, it has been shown on the US and UK participants that you tend to uh, associate healthy eating with morality, which mm -hmm. is a quite shocking <laughs> association to me. But uh, my surprise friend is working on replicate this result on Chinese people. So uh, I tried it out. Uh, I translated the their measurements into Chinese and back translate to guarantee the linguistic equivalence. Uh, but you know their uh, measurements were like the classical type of liquid scale. You have uh, statements like uh, eating healthy food is virtuous and you should uh, indicate on a one to seven scale um, to what extent you agree with this uh, statement. So you have strongly disagree to strongly agree. Uh, but I was a bit worried about this measurement, and so I also um, left an open-end question. Um, what do you think of those statements, and why you disagree or agree with those statements? And these two measurements yield very different results. So for the liquid scale, the standardized classical way of measuring it, so the Chinese participant answer is heavily screwed towards the agreement side. So if I only look at that results, I would conclude that Chinese people also associate healthy eating with uh, morality. But then when I look at the comments they left, they were like, well, mm, those statements are strange, but um, eating healthy food is not immoral. It's not unethical. So I still chose a gray. So, so you can see that mm, even the most basic kind of measurement will be influenced by some sort of um, cross-cultural differences that mm -hmm. we are missing out. So the conception of disagreement mm -hmm. can be different across culture, and the the like the motivate the, the level of motivation needed to indicate a disagreement would be different across culture because maybe I don't know it's speculative, but. It's probably because in our education, in our culture, we were not uh, trained, encouraged to uh, publicly express disagreement. So anyway, we see this difference between the between how people think and what they indicate on a standardized liquid scale. And imagine how many papers, how many quantitative research on Chinese participants has been relying on this kind of measurement. And the result they produce may not even be reflecting what Chinese people are thinking. And this kind of difference is neglected by mm, the current paradigm. And uh, it's a shame that we cannot look into this kind of difference uh, if we only rely on the quantitative methods. So yeah, I would like, uh, I wish this situation could change. So, mm, so both in terms of methodology and theoretical frameworks should Consider not just mm, not just the like the not just it's not enough to, to have a larger a broader sample. It's, it requires to really use a different mindset to look at those mm -hmm. cultural difference. So that's just basically what I'm talking about. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so hi everyone. I will also start with some personal examples. So I started developing my ideas and theories about human mind and society behavior when I was relatively young, maybe 14 to 15 years, years old. 
and I was impacted by various intellectual and social cultural influences. So intellectually, I was at a time reading a lot of Croatian literature. I was also, for example, interested in French realism, Russian realism, uh, in German romanticism, in some postmodern literature. Then I was a lot impacted by music. I was listening to rap music on the other hand. On one hand, on the other hand, I was listening to classical music, atonal music, uh, modern music, which is also atonal music, of course. Then I liked art, I liked philosophy, and those were all my kind of intellectual influences. On the other hand, from social cu cultural influences, I grew up in a very interesting time. In, in I was born in Croatia, and I grew up still in communism, and then I basically lived through uh, the entire transition uh, through war and from communism into capitalism. And the interesting thing was, for example, how it, in communism you could buy only one thing and no one really cared about consumption that much. But then in capitalism, when you could buy more and more things, that's when basically people started being very interested in, in, in consumption. So those kind of things, the impact of war, and then I was also a part of a hip hop community, Croatian hip hop community, I was a rapper, we were having shows. And that also inspired a lot of my intellectual ideas because what was very different is that like in the rap world and in the art world, people really care about ideas. That, that's it, you need to have like very interesting lyrics. Uh, and what kind of shocked me later in science is that it's really more about where you publish rather than what you publish in the end. Although that's also important, but it's more, imp but it's more important where you publish it. So why I'm saying this is because when I kind of started entering academia, I had already pretty well developed ideas and some kind of theories. And I thought I would basically then be able to express them. But when I came to academia, kind of when I started my graduate studies, I realized that all, all of these ideas that I had are kind of pretty worthless. And not, not because of they didn't have any merit, but because I didn't really develop them with any kind of scientific conventions in mind. I didn't know anything about science. And how science functions. I only wanted to solve problems and I focused on how to solve those problems intellectually by drawing on various different influences. Anything else was not really important to me. And I think many young people who come to academia to a great to a large degree experience similar problems. They have various ideas from before, they come to academia, and then in a way they need to completely change the way they think, as I had to, to eventually be able to enter academia and succeed. And basically in a way from all these colorful food to use Fred's metaphor, they need to start eating, eating lentils every day because that's, that's, that's what intellectual life in academia feels like <laughs> to, to a large degree. And now if thinking in that way really helps science and increase scientific knowledge, that would be good. And I would say, okay, I need to do it to increase scientific knowledge and human knowledge in the end. But the problem is that it's completely the opposite. This doesn't actually increase knowledge. It's actually completely stifles, stifles knowledge. So if you just think about, for example, if there is some great theory that can explain everything or some very good theory, we as people can never be sure how far away or close we are to that theory. That's simply because we do not have great knowledge of the universe. We, we know basically very little about the universe. So no matter how many articles we published in Nature or no many, how many Nobel Prizes we got, that doesn't mean that we are on the right track. We could be, but it could also be very wrong. And that's in fact what happened in science in the past. People like Aristotle was popular for let's say a thousand years. People used his approach. Then they switched. They used Ptolemaic, Ptolemaic uh, uh, system of planets and uh, uh, planetary system. Then it was heliocentric system. So always basically, people will go into one direction, then they would think that they're right. And then in the end, they start to doing something completely else. And from that perspective, given that we do not have the ultimate knowledge, the best way to actually find a theory or some, or some pretty good explanation of the world is not to go into one direction. It's really to basically allow people who have very different ideas and views to come and work in science because only in that way, maybe one of these people find something. If you have all people following in the same direction, then very likely you can be wrong because you're going only into one direction, everything else is neglected. And that's that's a big problem. That's to me personally, why having many different viewpoints and ideas and opinions is very important. And obviously what I think is that 
science should be separated from norms and conventions. So science itself is difficult to define it, but in a nutshell, the idea behind science is that if you have some ideas or views, they to some in some way need to be in in reflected in reality that is visible to, to other people as well. If it's only in your mind, then it's imagination. If it's basically visible to someone else, if other people can notice it, if you can in some way demonstrate it, then it becomes science. That's at least my, my definition, but maybe other people can have different definition. How you do that, how you demonstrate it, how you write it, how you approach the topic, anything else, that's not science. Those are scientific conventions that we use, but they have nothing to do with knowledge and with science. And I have some ideas of how we could actually improve diversity of, of thinking. And one of them, for example, will does focus on journals. I will not repeat what other speakers said. So my view is that journals should consciously attempt to separate science from scientific conventions. So the problem with scientific conventions is that in many cases, they are not fully conscious, they can be implicit. We maybe recognize them when we start entering science, but then we kind of learn them and we start functioning in that way. So when we write an article, we are not conscious about it. So I think what would be very important is, for example, if different people together write a very comprehensive list of scientific conventions and norms, and then journal, when they evaluate the article, they will make sure that they do not accept an article just because it only follow conventions and they, they, do, they, they do not reject an article because it doesn't follow conventions. So I think that's a very important thing because a lot of if, when you start writing articles and if you look at the rejections and what the reviewers write, a lot of that is you are aligned or not aligned with certain, certain conventions. So that's very important from my perspective. And another important thing is allowing scientists to express their personality. So what do I mean by that? So first thing is language. Today we try to standardize language in, in science and we are already talking about it a bit, but technically you can write in many ways. You can write poetry, prose, songs, you can write long and short, so you can use any possible language. And I think that if we are to come up with different ideas, we also need to use language differently, depending on how you want to use it. Some people may like standardized language, some people may like something completely else. Then another aspect where kind of their personality should be expressed more is type of publications. So today, if you want to get tenure and other promotions, obviously everything is based on articles. You publish certain articles and then people evaluate those articles. But article as a form is extremely limiting. Uh, and the interesting thing is that those articles, for example, in physics, in physics, their math may be limiting because physics ideas can be very short. So you can express a lot in the article. In social sciences, in a small article, you can really express almost nothing. So in a way, what we should allow people not force them to write articles, but to do what they want. If someone wants to write an article and that comes naturally, this person can do it. If someone if prefers to write a book for 20 years, this should also be allowed. We should never push people to publish like few articles per year, year because that simply really kills any bigger ideas that can exist. So these are some of the views that I have. And I think at the moment, academia is really extremely bad when it comes to encouraging this diversity of, of thinking. Uh, I mean, the, the emphasis when it comes to diversity, like some people mentioned, is maybe on social cultural diversity or ethnic diversity, where academia, I mean academia, I mean people who, who constitute academia is trying to do something, but even there we can do much, much better. But if you think about diversity of thought, even if you get people from diverse backgrounds to come into science, uh, what kind of scientific community does in many cases is still imposes a certain way of thinking. And then those people who maybe may have different backgrounds and who may have a lot, of, a lot to say, they are still forced to think in the same way. And that's a big problem for knowledge gener generation. So I think actually, if we are to encourage and increase ethnic and social cultural diversity in academia, we first need to encourage diversity of thought, because if we encourage diversity of thought, then all those people who are coming from different ethnic and social cultural backgrounds will not feel like they're stifled in academia. They will feel that they're able to express what they think, and they will be actually motivated and encouraged to 
stay in academia. And that's yeah, these are kind of my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your contributions. Before um, uh, asking, I mean, getting questions from, from the floor, I wanted to ask a common question to every one of you, and perhaps you share your views. Um, so the, the, the question I had in mind is the following. Uh, what should we do then to uh, save social science? from a lack of diversity? What would you suggest, like the first thing? So Dario, you suggested some ideas, but what would you uh, propose? Who wants to kick off? So let's go. Um, yeah, good question. <laughs> I'd, uh, I don't know what the answers are. <laughs> but um, I, I think Dario raises an important point. Um, and I think it's also related to what, to what Lee Hunt said. Um, one can encourage um, diversity across social categories into academia, but academic norms are very strong and therefore they may just, you may still produce the same thing that was produced otherwise, but just oh, yeah. with different people. Um, so I kind of agree with that. However, uh, I would simply say that um, everyone should have an equal right to come to academia and be students. <laughs> so so if, if academia is not currently producing what it should produce, um, we still need to encourage a kind of equal opportunity to come to academia and still produce the same shit. But, but we should obviously be encouraging um, other elements to make sure that the, the, what we are producing is bringing us into a more or less comfortable relationship with reality. Something like that. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, just to maybe jump off from that, I mean, there are just always going to be some people who are not going to be able to reach the highest levels of science and, you know, maybe don't have the most scientific training, but have a voice, have an interest, and are going to have something to contribute. So, you know, the question is, you know, how can we meaningfully integrate amateurs, independent researchers into the, the scientific conversation? Um, and it's, I don't know, it's, it's not an easy thing. I mean, what, you know, ideally, you know, an amateur is, is they're coming with some kind of passion or, or curiosity. Um, but, you know, in the long run, you're going to have to find some way to produce value for that person. Um, so I think, you know, one example is, you know, if I can't do a PhD, but maybe uh, there's an academic that I can collaborate with and we write a book. Um, and we, I think, in our paper referenced some examples of that, you know, in the sense that I still, you know, want to do something that requires research and requires, you know, a long period of time, and I want something to show for it. I maybe can't work full time on a PhD, but if at the end I publish a book and, you know, that's something I can put on my resume, like that's something that can be, you know, very meaningful for, for an amateur to actually kind of uh, participate in the kind of scientific conversation. So, just finding ways to uh, provide value to people outside the system to, to kind of get them involved. Um, that's, that's something I think we need to need to think on. Um, I would like to add maybe a similar thing. Uh, I think science, like Dario said, yes, the major scientific contribution in science is to find something critical to make the thing, to um, take part in the thinking part. But I think with increasing changes in academia and the way science works, I think we need to first, of course, get rid of journals and <laughs> understand or develop new ways of uh, publishing or sharing the knowledge we found. Mm. But I also think we need to change what we understand by scientists. Because right now we are, as academics, I mean, I don't know how many of you are academics, but in academy, we do so many things that takes our time from the actual science we are doing. But this could be, this work could be done by so many other people who can also contribute to science. So I think the real problem here is that we have an ideal scientist in our mind and we try to fit everyone into that description. Mm -hmm. So instead we should, I think, 
incentivize teamwork. And for instance, recently, uh, normally scientists were asked to communicate their findings to the public and write blog posts, mm -hmm. write, I don't know, news pieces, etc. But then uh, people understand that some people at like high status uh, understood that uh, it's not possible for academics to do everything at the same time. So then the science communicators came along. So anyone who had a PhD but didn't want to uh, continue in academia, they went uh, into that direction, became science communicators. So I think in science, we have lots of lots of different positions that should be created but are not created at the moment and people from any background can come and contribute to science it's not just the thinking that makes the science important and visible i think we we need lots of different skills lots of different uh, people from a variety of backgrounds to come together and make something important make a an important progression, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. And uh, I probably want to add, because I'm the most junior researcher here. So uh, I have this, because I have been the GTA and also you guys are always been, have been teaching. So I, I kind of feel that we should also incorporate that sense of diversity in when you are like teaching students because education like if the education process are uh, trying to shape the students thought into certain direction then later on when they become academics they would also find it hard to break that shell that they have been in, that have been enforced on them also um it's like also our admission process like when we select students we tend to uh selects certain type of students like would you say so it's not just who have access to become a, a scientist it's also like who have access to education um, mm -hmm. in the first place and we have this i have because i'm from a very different culture background we have this training on how to write a personal statement that will be more likely to be admitted to a uk university mm -hmm. so yeah we have to firstly train ourselves in that certain type of thinking pattern to get admitted here, to get the opportunity to study here. And that whole process is already introducing a selection bias and, and already like ruling out many people who think differently, who have different experiences. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dario, do you want to add something? to what you mentioned, no? So, all right. So I might ask uh, uh, some additional questions to every one of you in relation to your presentation. Um, Nihan, what's, what will be some of the examples of the poor but widely accepted norms that in your opinion we should challenge uh, in science? Well, I can give lots of examples from publication process like the young set. Uh, for instance, when you, uh, Let's say um, I'm a Turkish person collecting data from US and just publishing my paper with data from America. And in that case, I will possibly not get very bad reviews. But if I were to collect data from other countries in the, uh, in the world, then reviewers will ask me to justify why I collected data from that certain countries. This is a widely accepted norm. And this is, of course, controversial in so many ways, but uh, this happens a lot. Also, some research also shows that, for instance, uh, if we have some research findings from the United States, we generalize it to all humanity. Whereas if we have findings from another country, we say that mm, they are different because their culture is different. As if people in the United States don't have a culture. Mm -hmm. So. I think we, sorry. No, we might not, I don't know. <laughs> so, we still need more research needed. <laughs> so I think we should, like, these are some of the most um, lively things that come to my mind, but yeah, in general, we should get rid of this reviewing culture, the 
publication system be sending your papers to be accept, read and reviewed by three people, then deciding, then deciding your fate or the idea, uh, the fate of your idea getting to the world is a really problematic issue, I think. Mm -hmm. For that reason, I think we should try to like create new processes, challenge these norms, new processes, new ways of publishing or sharing our ideas with the world in open places and inclusive places. And one other thing, one other norm I would like to, uh, I will say I would like to change, but it's not possible, of course, but I just, every time I write an article, I just imagine that if there was a platform where I could just publish my paper, I would publish in English, but then my friend from Turkey could publish in Turkish. Then we could just read the translations of it so that we know that everyone from anywhere in the world can contribute to this scientific place because I, I don't know, but I was playing uh, during COVID uh, pandemic, I got into playing strategy games. And in that games, when we were uh, in war, we were messaging each other with my friends from all over, around the world, but everyone was writing in their own language. Mm. And the <coughs> system was, was automatically translating it to my chosen language. So if we can do that in strategy games, I wonder why we couldn't do it in science, which to me is very weird. Yeah. Someone's going to make a lot of money off that. <laughs> I hope when they do, they invite me to. <laughs> I'm sure Chat GPT could do that now. <laughs> Even write scientific articles. <laughs> the, just to follow up on what Nihan mentioned, there is a study that uh, reviewed scientific articles in psychology. And indeed, uh, they observed that, for instance, when there is an article that says uh, the role of social identity on meat consumption. That's by default when it's on American participants. So they don't say in the US, but if they connect in China or in Turkey or in every other place, you will have written in China or in Turkey. So you have like, you narrow down the conclusions. And so by default, the standard, as I said initially, who sets the standard? The standard is the US centric uh, model of uh, psychology. So we, I mean, this is a question that is there in the literature, but it's we still have these procedures, we still have these things in place that maintain this kind of reproduction of the US centric uh, uh, way of thinking about uh, psychology, the fact that the journals are controlled to some extent. Uh, by American scholars, North American, US uh, scholars. Mm -hmm. uh, and also the fact that you always think about the reviewers. There is something when you're an academic, you, you have your idea. By the time your idea is published, basically it takes ages. So that at the end, you are just like sick of your paper. You don't want to see it anymore. Like literally, you don't want to read it anymore. But the thing is that you always think of, I need to anticipate what the reviewers are going to ask for. And basically it's, systematically what Nihan mentioned is that no I'm going to put a US sample because if I don't put one I will be asked when there is not one you see mm. and if you don't replicate the results perhaps it's because of the culture of the people it's not because of the initial study so you replicate the study with an American sample and then you show that there is a difference because of the culture so by default we assume that the American sample is the one that is going to tell you the truth but the truth doesn't come out of the blue. The truth is always, to some extent, politically constructed. It depends on the standard that you are going to set initially and where the science has been crafted and the knowledge has been developed. So that's very striking. And think about, of course, social class and uh, uh, race issues and so on that are uh, revolving around science and that could also uh, contribute to this. Uh, and um, I wanted to follow up with... Um, what you mentioned, uh, Roger, and ask you a question. So how can people outside of uh, academia make original contri co contributions to uh, psychological uh, science, in your opinion? How could they make this contribution? Yes, so this goes to a lot of the thinking that was in Dario and I's paper, where, you know, just trying to think about blind spots, just areas, ways of doing research that because of, you know, the incentives and norms and constraints of the scientific system are just going to be really hard for professionals to, to actually do. So mentioned like longer term projects, 
theory development that might take a very long time. Um, but going along with that, uh, just basic observational research, uh, something that's you know one of the most fundamental scientific activities. But the reality is, as a professional, you, you really want your research to be sort of sexy and impressive and prestigious. Uh, so that's going to bias you towards studies that cost a lot of money with high-tech equipment and huge sample sizes and massive data sets. And that's fine, but, and I think, you know, you touched on there's kind of a bias against qualitative research, um, but you know, certainly an amateur could do, you know, very detailed observational research, maybe of some, you know, specific culture or like maybe, you know, some kind of domain that a professional wouldn't really have access to. Um, so that's certainly an area where I think amateurs can uh, you know, produce something really fundamental that then can be built upon by, you know, experiments. But uh, so that's one. Um, speculation, I think, is is another big one. Uh, of course, you know, there's nothing really stopping anyone from just, you know, knowing what the theories are and trying to go beyond them or adding speculation of, for, you know, things that are maybe not technically possible just yet. And, you know, for professional scientists, there's a lot of good reasons why it's it's hard to speculate. Uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about the publishing process. Um, and you're just you you have this attitude like, yeah, you're thinking about what is the reviewer going to criticize me on? Um, and science is just especially now. And I think this is kind of something that's we've touched on indirectly, just the level of competition. It creates a just a mood of I need to reduce my attack surface. Like any possible way I could be criticized becomes problematic in your mind. Um, so you take out that extra paragraph that shares what you think is a really interesting speculation, but the reviewer might say, oh, that's, you know, you're just speculating. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, to go to a metaphor, you know, it, it is risky because if you're going to go out on a limb, like that limb might break and that becomes something that, you know, could be even the slightest black mark on your record, um, which, you know, can really influence future prospects. Um, you know, so that's maybe a, a bad reason or just, you know, something about the kind of culture of science now that makes it hard. Um, but of course, with just like the climate of misinformation, fake news and and all that, you know, there are very also very real reasons why scientists should be careful and, you know, an amateur maybe someone who's like an anonymous blogger might feel more uh, willing to just kind of throw out ideas. Um, so that's one, I think, uh, obviously like uncommon research areas, things that are maybe not um, not very sexy right now or common popular in science, you're not gonna get a lot of money for it. Things that might be controversial for one reason or another, or, you know, we talked about just as uh, an amateur, you might bring very different life experiences to your investigations. Um, and that will allow you to, you know, just study some topic that maybe, uh, you know, an academic would just be less likely to even consider. Um, and I think, you know, another one last big one is aimless projects. Uh, things where you don't have a very predetermined outcome necessarily. And I think, the whole paradigm of science and having to apply for grants is very oriented towards, you know, calling your shot. Like, this is what I'm gonna do. Here's how I'm gonna do it. Here's what I'm gonna find. And, you know, so an amateur, you know, not being beholden to, you know, having to worry about applications and things might be able to do projects that can, you know, evolve and have kind of room to breathe. Um, and I think, Again, it's just a different way of thinking and working. So, you know, another metaphor would be, you know, in today, it's it's almost as if we told all painters, you need to first sketch out in, in pencil first what you are then going to paint. And that, that's the only way you can possibly do painting, um, which is one way to do it. And some painters like that. But, you know, some people would prefer to just start painting and let the medium Kind of tell them what to do and let it evolve and you know just like you would get different kinds of artwork from that you can get different kinds of science so um those are like just some kind of like strategies and ideas that i think amateurs should uh really try to focus in mm -hmm. thank you i'm just conscious of time so actually i think we have uh, 15 minutes left am i correct 
Yes. So perhaps uh, if you do have questions, we are very happy to take some questions. Say, I can see a question here. You can pass the. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello. I have a question for Dario about curiosity. And because you mentioned all these um, kind of interests that started when you were a child, what do you think nurtured that? And how do you think that played a different role in the way you approach scientific research? And um, sorry, it's a double fold, mm -hmm. two fold question. Another one is, um, what do you think really helped you see the lack of diverse modes of expression in social sciences? And how do you think liberating such restrictions could bring to academia? Mm -hmm. So the first question, obviously, I don't really consciously know it. What made me interested, uh, I, I mean, I, I was always relatively curious and interested in ideas. In old Yugoslavia, if you had like a grandparents, they always had books by Dostoevsky. You could find them like in any, in every cupboard in a way. So there was always like a lot of reading and my mom reading to me, but obviously consciously, I don't really know. But I, uh, I, I saw it in a relatively pure way where I was interested in some things or solving some problems. And I was just reading and trying to do it in any way possible that I could know. So I didn't know anything basically about science or how science functions or about publications. My, my view was more like in a Buddhist way, like Buddha, you, you see the problem of suffering, you focus on the problem, how are you going to solve suffering? So that, that was basically my mindset and my approach. And what was also interesting is that like in, in, in for example, in primary school and high school, you, they would always teach, teach us like about big thinkers. But then when you enter academia, they start teaching you about little thinkers. So that's, it, 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 uh, not, to, not to insult anyone, but you get what I mean. First, some of them teach you the big picture, big things you can do, change the world. And then you come in academia and it's completely the opposite. And you need to basically work on a very small dot. And that obviously, I'm, I'm not saying like someone may prefer it, someone may not prefer it. But what we should have the freedom to do at least is to try to do it our own way and see if we can succeed. Because I spent huge amounts of energy rather than developing ideas, just trying to figure out how to actually fit into science and then how to take my old, ide old ideas that I had and publish them in science. So for example, my article on disconnected psychology, that's the idea I had probably like 15 years ago. And then I was trying to figure out how do I put it in science where people think I'm not crazy and how to make a very strong argument. And it took me a long time to find it. So uh, how, I mean, I, 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 I wish I knew how to, in a way, how to transform science in such a way that people can basically be encouraged to think the way they would think and the way they liked ideas when they were kids, rather than to try, rather than come to science and then to start seeing ideas in some kind of negative way and feel oppressed. Uh, also like what Fred, said in this metaphor and keeping keeping that love for science and ideas i think it's very important and if something kills that love and passion then i think uh, obviously you by default you're not using your full potential maybe you're publishing in great journals but you're not doing nearly what you could have been doing for example uh, we have a question over there <clears throat> Hi, um, first of all, thank you all so much for a really interesting and uh, yeah, enlightening panel. Um, I'm asking this question and just as a caveat as part of the editorial team for a journal. Uh, and I was wondering whether you could comment on the value of mentorship or maybe your experience of mentorship in improving diversity of thought and maybe the way that established journals can almost lean towards accepting or encouraging different kinds of creative outputs, you know, not just academic articles. Thanks again. Mm -hmm. Can I ask to clarify, when you say mentorship, do you mean uh, mentoring new editors or? Sorry, I should have clarified. Um, I meant mentorship more for, for example, early career researchers who are trying to get established in the field by more established, maybe older researchers. Mm. I think. <laughs> Uh, that's really important, especially because I, like when I, I have lots of uh, professors who um, know lots of professors who are editors and when we discuss papers to review and they usually tell this 
little stories about how people like some place in Asia or some place in Africa, after they get rejected, they email to editor and ask uh, whether they would like to write the paper together with them. Of course, editors think that this is weird, but it might be the only opportunity that the authors of that paper have. So I think uh, rather than maybe, yes, we should focus on mentoring early career people, but we should also think about uh, beyond the global north, what? Because lots of people from global south, from different countries who don't have many uh, opportunities to uh, have a mentor are trying to make space for themselves in the global uh, scientific knowledge production. So I think journals have a system for that too. But interestingly, I would also say that we should also um, mentor editors as well to, <laughs> make them less racist, less sexist, or less methodologist. I don't know if that's the word, <laughs> but yeah, like, because like we discussed the norms and the requirements of journals are at this point really sometimes pointless. So I think we should maybe get rid of these norms, get rid of these conventions, and try to be more open about what we want to achieve with this, with a specific journal. And as editors, I think the best thing you can do is to just be open-minded, yeah. Just to jump in off that too. I mean, I think you touched on, I mean, mentors, uh, you know, as you come in, you're coming in as a PhD student, you don't know about all these norms and you like, really need to be coached through like how do I actually get published how do I write in this tone and style um, and so I think you know that's a lot of coaching that has to happen from the mentor angle but I would like to see and you know this speaks to you Daria like also just making students when they come in aware that you know if you only are there's a really deep connection between the style you write and the style you think um, and you know to me I see it as like really problematic that you know, the sort of master values of scientific writing now are just clarity, concision, get straight to the point. Um, and that's important, obviously, like concision and, you know, efficiency of communication. Uh, but those are relatively kind of uniform and convergent things. And when you have this just homogeneity of how people write and sort of all like subjectivity and aesthetic value are, are sucked out of it, that creates, uh, you know, I think adding aesthetic value to writing, whether it's adding, you know, emotion, beauty, or humor, those are just inherently diversifying. Um, and so for readers and writers, I would like mentors to remind them, but that like, it's okay to like, try to find ways to inject uh, some of these, you know, aesthetic values. And, you know, just an example is like, you adding a, a joke into your writing, it might, you know, It'd be actually, you know, have an interesting observation there that somebody reads and one person might, that joke might land with them and inspire them to think in a certain way, or, you know, that little story you add will land with one person. And like, that just provides a jumping off point for a diversifying effect when not everything is just so uniform and concise and, and clear. So, you know, just kind of reminding, you know, your students of that connection and just trying to hold on to some you know, of your own voice and personality and, and how you write. Um, and just just very quickly, we have, you know, Seeds of Science, the journal that Dario and I founded, that is like we are one of the main focuses is trying to really allow diversity of style, form, content. Um, so, you know, we've even had some papers that like weaved in a little sci-fi narrative and then went back into, you know, how could we get there? Things that were written in a very kind of winding and sort of indirect tone. And, you know, we think just providing some kind of alternative journal space for that kind of writing is something we're, you know, really believe in. Thank you. I just... Uh... Check, I can see several questions, but perhaps we can take a question from the uh, from online. Uh, yep, we have a question from Mariah, who's an open university student. If you invite amateurs into science, then how do you avoid harmful misinformation, such as conspiracy theorists, racist ideas, becoming science? I mean, I mean, 
I can say, say my view. So by default, the more you think and the more ideas you produce, there will also be some crazy ideas there. So I think in the process of discovery, by default, you, you will come up with things that may be perceived as conspiracy theories or ideas that don't make sense. But if you do invite them, I would say that engaging in dialogue can be beneficial because then at least you're having dialogue between many people and they may see different perspectives, they may still keep their point of view, but they at least may also try to consider uh, different perspectives. So that's that's kind of how I how I see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's no uh, there's no silver bullet there. It's the same kind of norms around just open debate and discussion that we have in science. And uh, you know, people are always going to have crazy ideas, regardless. So maybe at least feeling like they can actually participate um, will you know just kind of help them develop a more scientific mindset or not yeah. i mean if you look at the like for example isaac newton isaac newton in his free time he was basically alchemist he was interested in alchemy and he even indicated that he considered that more important than his scientific work obviously we appreciate isaac newton today because of his theories on gravity and laws of planetary motion but for him probably what was inspiring him is something that completely from today's point of view is a conspiracy theory and it doesn't make sense. And then you need to reconcile that in one person. So from my perspective, why wouldn't that be bad? So everyone can have some illusional thoughts or do something they find interesting. They can, on the other hand, also be scientists and create perfectly valid scientific ideas. I don't think this needs to be disconnected even in the same person. Can I just add something to that? Um, just to say that um, I don't assume that there are not racist ideas in the professional science. Mm -hmm. And also don't assume that the people who are employed to do the science are not themselves amateurs. So, you know, these things are yeah. th th these things are kind of happening anyway. And inviting new people into the space would not um, make that problem more or less great, in my view. Yeah. Uh, I, I can take a question over there at the back, yes. We have, I think, two or three minutes left. Am I correct? Hi, so apologies for this out of scope of the discussion, but my question is about accessibility and how that narrows diversity. So uh, to me, one of the biggest issues of getting into academia is uh, funding. Mm -hmm. And uh, coming from someone from a difficult social background, there's a lot of barriers. For instance, when I get a master's, uh, it's like a flat 10 grand fee, which barely covers the fees for London masters, you have to pay rent. Um, if you want to get a scholarship, you have to uh, kind of relive your trauma through these personal statements that can feel quite dehumanizing to kind of talk about the things you've gone through so that you can get some cash. Um, there's application fees, some sort of good part for masters. Uh, there's paid field trips for modules, and you might not be able to take a module you're less really interested in. The point is, um, there's political factors, like national political factors that affect these things. There's also cultural factors within universities that affect how funding is allocated that limit accessibility for students from poorer backgrounds. What do you guys think the uh, future or some answers are for that issue? Mm. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I think this is a super important point and uh, social class is, is key, particularly in the place that we're sitting now. Okay, this is where the most expensive uni is going. Um, this is a university that is a kind of a home for the international rich. So it's quite difficult as a working class person to navigate this space. And I certainly went through that myself. I think universities more generally, but LSE in particular, um, could think more laterally about the way it spends money to get particular kinds of outcomes. So for example, um, at one time, I was involved at the LSE in a, in a kind of board that was about diversity. I won't say exactly what the board was, but it was about a, 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 a one strand of diversity. And I would say that the time spent in, that, in those meetings and the kind of people that was in those meetings was costed more than it would have cost just to create 
more scholarships, more bursaries, make them easier to access, etc. So there's a lot of there's a lot of chat and there's a lot of time wasting and not a lot of direct action. And I think we need much more direct action on things that um, we think are important. And I think certainly as a London university, which London is of course a rich city, but there's huge um, pockets of deprivation in this place. Um, and if we want the student body to represent to represent London and to represent the UK, then we need to think more about how um, we can fund that effectively. But as you say, there are kind of national politics related to that as well. But I think there's a particular issue for postgraduate study, which mm -hmm. is one of the reasons why we don't get um, the level of diversity that we might want mm -hmm. at the MSc level and the PhD level. As you say, a master's degree is really expensive. Um, you can now get a loan, but that's taken out a loan. I was lucky enough to get a, a full scholarship, but I had to tell a story and that can be kind of traumatized if people have to kind of relive their stories in order to get access to funding and vice versa, my PhD was funded. So I was lucky in that sense, but unfortunately that luck is kind of the exception that proves the rule. You have to be lucky rather than kind of what other colleagues have been talking about, rather than just saying you've got really good ideas and we're going to find a way to make it happen. <laughs> um, so I would like us to shift to that kind of more human perspective and say, we value these ideas and because we value these ideas, we'll find a way to, to fund it and to bring this person into our academic community. So that's what I'd like to see. I can maybe add something to that. I don't know how you are familiar with universities in different parts of the world, but not in every country, mm -hmm. education mm -hmm. is expensive. In some <laughs> countries, it's free. Yeah. So that's another solution to go for. Yes. So. And not necessarily communist countries, guys, which is <laughs> because sometimes tend to think, oh, but if there is public transportation, this is communism, you know, in some places. Yeah. No, no, you can have free university and it's not called communism. It's just like you go to France or Germany, you can have free education. So <laughs> it's not like something that, you know, is an utopia. It does exist on earth. It's out there. We <laughs> might find some solution. Yeah. It is and possible. In fact, in other places in Europe, they actually pay you quite a lot to do your PhD. It's a it's a it's a proper job, and it is a proper job. To do. So you know, people should be remunerated. Um, do we have time to take one last question or not? I don't know. Who decides on this? Who is the? <laughs> we it's still yeah, no, okay. Do we? We have to stop. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. But thank you very much for coming thank here. Thank you. Uh, for